What we have here is failure to communicate. No, wait, no, sorry. Uh, what we really have is an Acer 910, the one that I had featured in an earlier video, but today we're going to um, try to rig up a clock battery for it so that I can at least save the hard drive settings and get it to boot, you know, properly. Um, hmm. The original battery was a 3.6 volt um, Tataran, but I'm going to substitute a 3 volt lithium coin cell battery. I'm going to do two very dangerous things that I don't suggest any of you do. Um, number one, I'm going to use a lower rated battery than the original. Number two, I'm going to solder wires directly to this battery. This is dangerous. <laughs> Don't do this. Do as I say, not as I do, as my father used to say. But in a pinch, you just have to do what you gotta do, I guess. But you should never do that. Ever. For any reason. Um, and I'll tell you why, because the risks are great. The battery could explode. That's pretty much the worst case scenario. Best case scenario, it works. Second to worst case scenario, battery doesn't function after we solder to it. Um, this is something that uh, is taught in the classrooms as something you just don't do. When they actually solder leads to these batteries or attach um, connection points to them, it's actually done with a small tack welder. The, uh, the battery is literally welded, or the, the contacts are welded to the battery using a jeweler's type tack welder. We don't have that, so I gotta do what I gotta do. I'm not proud, but I gotta do what I gotta do. The first thing we gotta do is sand through the um, coating they have on here, at least to rough it up a little bit. These batteries are basically chromed or plated with some kind of a... I believe it's chrome, actually. And um, we need to sand through that so that the solder will actually have something to bond to. That's good enough for government work. Now we're going to check the battery's voltage. I should have done that first. This battery actually came from an Apple remote that I never used. So, we're going to check the voltage output on it just to make sure it's still good. And uh, see what we get here. I'm going to use my, my what, $2 or $3 meter that I bought at Harbor Freight. <laughs> I call it Harbor Freight because the prices are frighteningly low. Oh, huh? freaking huh. Okay, battery is good for 3.19 volts, so it is still healthy. All right. Or healthy enough to uh, bring life back to this old clock. All right. Um, the next thing I need to do is I've already warmed up my iron here. Um, hmm. I need a suitable surface to solder on. That'll do. Now we're going to. I am a professional. Right. Um, technically I am, but when working on my own stuff, I just sort of do what I have to. Because I don't have an unlimited budget. And, uh, you know. First thing we're going to do is put a bead of solder on the front and the back of the side of the battery. Move this away so you can see it. You should be wearing safety goggles when doing something so stupid. Just a drop of solder. And then you want to let the battery cool before you start soldering the other side. Battery is still pretty cool. The trick is you got to keep the temperature down. Getting the battery hot is what causes explosions to happen. All right. 
Now I gotta let the battery cool. We got enough solder at least to get our terminals on there. The battery should be cool enough to hold right now, it is not. It is now overheated. So we gotta wait for that thing to cool off. Battery is cooled down quite a bit. Now it's ice cold. What I actually did is I put it in a plastic bag and put it in the ice cube tray. So now you got to make sure you have the polarity correct. The back side of the battery is 3 volts. I mean, um, positive. So we're going to fix our positive lead to the back side. And our negative lead to the front side. You would think that these coin cell batteries are the other way around, but the truth is they're not. No, they they do this just to screw with you. Because you would think that the back of the battery, which is the largest part, meaning the ground, I guess, would be positive, uh, uh, negative, but it ain't, so. So anyway. So here we go. This is a messy soldering job, if I ever did see one. But the truth is, I don't have all that much time to to get the uh, the solder as hot and as spread out as I'd like to. <sighs> I don't want to damage the battery and cause a meltdown. Now we're going to cool the battery off and check the voltage. Okay, battery is now cooled off. And we're going to now check the voltage with a multimeter. $2 Harbor Freight Special is good enough for me. That's what we're going to use. And we do this because we want to make sure that the battery isn't damaged from the heat. 3.19 volts, so there was no damage that I can tell to the battery. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually cover the battery in heat shrink tubing. So it actually looks like something we bought at Radio Shack. Pretty cool, huh? Once again, Harbor Freight saves the day. I bought this heat shrink tubing for like a dollar. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was incredibly cheap. So what we're going to do is cut a section off this uh, size right for the battery. And we're going to apply some heat to the tubing. And um, if we need to trim it down later, we can. So there we go. We're going to open up the heat shrink tubing as best we can with our fingers to make a tube and slip the battery right in there. This might be too small, but it might be just right. I think it's a little on the small side. Might have to go one size bigger. So we've got our heat shrink tubing all set up. I cut a one, one uh, three quarter inch by three quarter inch square. And we're going to center the battery in that square, like so, and apply the heat. For those of you familiar with cocaine use or uh, crack use, um, you might actually have one of these lighters around. Um, just kidding. Uh, basically what we're going to be using is a little mini torch type lighter and I'm going to try to get the shrinking action on the film here so I'm going to put the camera right there okay this is pretty cool how the stuff shrinks down like that just apply the heat um, it's really designed to be used with a uh, with a small heat gun It works better that way, actually. Uh, this stuff isn't shrinking correctly. <laughs> oh, there it goes. You wanna, you don't want to burn the stuff because it will burn. It doesn't take a lot of heat. Oh, the battery slipped out a little bit. So we're gonna push it back into the material there. Okay, a little further. There we go. 
Okay, now we're going to reapply the heat. This is essentially how they make these batteries in this in the uh, in the plants in China, roughly. They're using a different kind of shrink tubing. The stuff that they use in the plants is like a film that um, is designed specifically for this purpose. But we're not fancy like that here on B Bishop PCM World. Um, I think it's shrunkish, shrunking, shrinking, shrink. It's going to do. Okay, good. So that's it. Now the battery is protected. It won't ground out to anything. So when we affix this to the side of the case. It won't affect anything. Now, is 3 volts enough to power the clock in this beast? I would like to think so. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt anything, at least so. If it does, well, at least we tried. Now, seriously though, <laughs> I don't think we have anything to worry about. Um, the Tataran batteries are available on eBay. The 4.0 3.6 or 3.7 volt batteries are widely available. Um, so this isn't really necessary. But I just have some things I want to try with this machine and I can only do it if the clock battery is functioning. You know, in saving system settings. Um, I'm trying to add a second floppy drive to it. I took out the Irwin tape drive. I don't have any tapes for it anyway and it doesn't really matter. I'm never going to use it. So I figured, what the hell stick another floppy drive in there. One of these days I'm going to try to find a pair of matching 1.2 megabyte floppies or a three and a half inch uh, floppy to stick in there. But until then I gotta live with what I have. So The original owner by the way of this machine is the guy I bought the claw machine from. He actually ran his vending business on on this machine for about 10 years and is still using the same software that he ported over to a Windows XP laptop to this very day. Um, the vending software I don't think I showed you guys, but it was featured in the video that I made when I first got this thing running, so take a look in the archives, it's there somewhere. Um, just to recap, this is a Looks like a, um, I thought it was a 386, but it's actually a 286. <gasps> um, yeah, 8286. There's the Intel 286 processor right there. I'll try to get some, here we go, now you can read it. But that is what a 286 processor looks like. Um, and these were used well into the late 1980s when this thing was actually built, so I gotta get this thing back together though. Just to give you guys an idea as to the dire condition this machine was in when I got it, this keyboard is what the entire system looked like. Yuck. And then I cleaned it. Now this has the original, this is unique because it still has the original keyboard and monitor and I got it from the original owner. He says he has the manual somewhere, and he's actually going to look for them uh, for me, so I'm hoping that someday I'll get them. But, um, here goes nothing. And I say that because nothing will happen. So obviously, CMOS is all messed. I have to set all the settings, and, and that's going to be fun. Oh wait, did I miss something? Okay, yes I did. It's supposed to ask me if I want to run setup. Control Alt Escape. There we go. Ah, that's how you do it. Okay, so we're going to floppy drive A. By the way, I never did hook this up. 
Uh, the cables are too short, so I've got to get some more cables. I was going to put it in this bay here, but I don't have the cover for this bay. It's a different cover, so it's a mess. Anyway, uh, let's see. Drive A. It should be a th one. I believe it's a 1.2 meg. No, it's a 360. It's got to be. Okay. Fixed disc one. Five. Type one. I'm going to have to keep trying. Yeah, how did I do that? Reboot. Let's try that. I don't remember the drive type I used. Okay. I'm gonna put the cam put the key uh, camera down. You see, the problem here is these older machines did not have um, automatically detected by um, hard disk settings. You had to put the information in manually, and um, this thing must have more memory than 512k. I'd like to think. I don't remember the drive type. So you had to, each drive type. Um, referred to a specific drive um, geometry landing zone sectors per track capacity uh, number of heads and without knowing what the original drive type is and I don't really know that answer I don't know what the setting should be so I'm just putting them in at random until I pick one up that works um, I got lucky when I first ran this thing and I I should refer back to that video I recorded, and uh, it'll tell me what I used. I had printed off a chart that listed every type by drive size. And uh, what we have here, I could never find the parameters for this drive, but what we have here is a rather rare um, Micropolis. Is that what it is? A yeah, mini scribe, and we don't know what the drive type is, <laughs> um, or what the parameters are. That's kind of unfortunate. Um, so it's a model eighty eight zero five one A, and I don't even know what the hell it is. So um, it's kind of difficult for me to to just get it the first time. You know what I mean? Let's do another reset and try a couple of different drive parameters. While we're here, let's see if it accepts today's date. Hey, no way. <laughs> That's incredible. And time, we're going to set that. This is obviously in military time, so... Uh, let's see. Hour... Uh, let's see... It's 9 o'clock, so... 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 21, 54. Okay. Now, what we're going to do next, obviously, we still haven't gotten the hard drive picked up yet. Um, I think 34 is what I used. We're going to actually shut her down and see if it comes up with the right date and time. If it did, then it means that my battery fix worked. So here's to hoping. The drive is formatted with Windows 3.0, so it should boot up when I get the right drive parameters in there. It will boot up, actually once that happens, if that happens. But now I've got to go back to my notes that I took and uh, let's just shut her off. I 
wait for that drive to spin down and I'm gonna go right into BIOS with it. Okay, it still has the correct eight time in floppy drive, so that we're getting somewhere. I'm gonna try type 17. I did some homework and it looks like that might be it. So for a 40 meg drive, it is a 41 megabyte drive, by the way. Uh, in case you guys are wondering, I know I was. Um, what's the correct? Up oh, there it goes. Got it. Okay. Now the problem I had was one of my floppies was defective. So I couldn't copy everything over to the drive. But anyway, we should restart this thing and uh, make sure it boots up under its own steam with my jerry-rigged battery carefully tucked in the back of the machine. Considering this system is now 20, about 24 years old, <laughs> it only has uh, 512 kilobytes of RAM, which is incredibly low, even for a 286. Most 286s had at least one megabyte of RAM. There isn't a whole hell of a lot this thing will run outside of original IBM PC software, um, which is kind of a shame. It's a really cool machine. Uh, I'm going to look at getting some other parts for it. I want to get... I'd really like to get more memory for it. Um, so I need to find a memory expansion for it. Or, oh wait, I can just buy the chips. And uh, I just need to find out what memory chips I need. Um, you know, I've never in my life have I ever had to buy memory for one of these uh, socketed... chip socketed type machines. I've never had to do that before. This could be a learning experience. Um, most of the older systems I've had use memory expansion boards with sockets on them, and you just... I've never had to populate one before. Now I do. Oh, how do I get myself into these messes? You might ask. I don't know. Anyway... The thing runs. That's, that's half the battle. Um, I don't know. I do have a nice set of matching 360k drives I could pop into this thing. And uh, it looked pretty cool. I might just do that. Um, in other news... And they're white. No, I think they're black. They might be black. Could they be any whiter? But I'll pop these in there. They're a matching set. The connectors are in the same location in each drive, so I should be able to plug them in pretty easily. And I'll have dual floppies and a hard drive. Now, back in those days, that was a big deal. <laughs> well, the dual floppies were really handy if you didn't have a hard drive. Yes, kids, there was a day when hard drives were pretty much a luxury item. I'd say up until the early 90s, um, you could still buy a computer without a hard drive. You would just pop in whatever floppy disk you needed for the day and uh, save to another floppy disk. If you had a single floppy machine, like I did, um, you were swapping floppies like a madman just to get anything done. And um, Which is why my first computer really didn't see much use. Because it was such a pain in the ass to use. It was easier for me to just type everything up on the old Smith Corona. <laughs> that he used the home computer that I was blessed with. Um, which I still have. It's the only computer from my early days that I still own. Unfortunately, the monitor is long gone. Regrettably. Um, it couldn't be saved. The, um, well, I could have recapped it, but it was just, it was bad. Yeah, that's pretty much what it needed. It needed a full recapping. And I was just too lazy to do it, and uh, I let it go. I let it go with my Tandy 1000 SX that I recently sold for a hundred bucks. 
to a software developer, <laughs> of all people. Very interesting. I put it on Craigslist, and within, oh god, w within an hour of posting this machine, I got an email from a guy who was like three towns over. Um, his name, I forgot what his name was, but he developed a version of Pac-Man that'll run on anything, called Paku Paku. He wanted the candy so that he could use it for testing his software. So, no doubt he still has it. And he had to have it. And uh, I delivered it to him. <laughs> and I thought that was quite interesting. The guy was legally blind, but he could still see enough to, uh, to write code. So that takes a special kind of genius that I don't have. I don't even write code. But anyway. Um, so we're going to pop these drives out, both of them. And uh, let's just unplug them first. In all seriousness, though, this machine is actually just almost as good as that Tandy 1000 HX, uh, SX was, the one that I sold. Um, had pretty much the same capabilities. I do believe that Tandy had a 286, or was it a 186? I had a 186 Tandy at one time. It was a rare processor, only used in a couple of machines, but mostly used for industrial applications, not for the home computer business. Most people just went straight to a 286 or a 386 uh, from the 8088s and 8086s. Um, for a variety of reasons. But Tandy did release a machine with a 186. I don't remember what model it was. It might have been the 1000. Uh, it was in the 1000 family, I, that much I know, because I know I saw one. I had one. That was a 1000TX, I think, that I had. That was, in fact, a 186. Something like that. It was an oddball. So we're going to yank out the original floppy drives, and we're going to put in a matching set. The reason we're doing this is because the original floppy drive... Nothing wrong with it or anything perfectly fine, but um, we're missing a faceplate, and I need to stuff something in that faceplate hole, so I've chosen to um, add a floppy drive to it, but with two non-matching drives, it just doesn't look right, so I put in two matching floppy drives, two of them that I know are fully functional, and that is what I'm doing, and there's no need to use a tripod and you're not really missing anything um, at all. <laughs> so we're going to use these, uh, these drive rails here. Um, oops. It's interesting. They don't really fit together. Hmm. Bizarre. Hey, did that land in the computer? Oh, man. All right. Well, we'll continue on when these are installed. Well, the good news is this drive works marvelously. The problem is I can't seem to get both drives to work together, which is interesting because they both came out of a machine as a pair. And I'm thinking to myself, well, self, where's the Terminator jumper setting? There isn't one on either drive. But, oh wait, picked up the wrong one. There's a mess going on here. I gotta clean this up. This is disgusting. Anyway, uh, yeah, so 
Here we go. Here's the jumper settings, DS0, DS1, and yeah, there's that. But there's no Terminator jumper. But there is this right here, which says TP, which could be Terminator Power. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. The thing is, there really isn't a lot of documentation out in the World Wide Web anymore relating to this stuff, because, let's face it, not many people care about it. <laughs> so, I'm left with a dilemma here. Do I stick with having a one single drive machine, or do I work harder and try to make both of them work? Well, ideally, that's what I'd like to do. Um, but, I don't know. Good news, everyone! I got it working. And here's how I did it. I set them both to DS1 and uh, popped them back in and um, let the cable do the deciding as to which drive is prioritized. And watch this. A. Oops. DIR. Link. And there it is. And now we're going to go to B. I love figuring things out like this because it wakes my memory up and it wakes my brain up especially and it helps me um, think. See, when you're working on modern equipment, you don't have to think. You just plug stuff in and it works. But when dealing with these old systems, it's not that simple. You actually have to know something. <laughs> I mean, honestly, now all the knowledge is in software. It was then, too, but you still had to know something about hardware to make a computer work. And, um, and that's what I like about these old, these old systems, is that you have to use your brain. You have to kind of figure things out, read books, in this case, scour the web for information. And um, you have to actually work to try to get something functioning. And it can be very rewarding. It can be very frustrating, too. Like, for instance, if I didn't know about the hard disk type, um, BIOS types, or um, parameter types, I would have never gotten this thing working. But I knew from my old days working on this old stuff you know, that that actually was quite important. You know? Um, I feel, f I feel sorry for anyone who is just now getting into vintage computing, like this era, and um, doesn't have any prior knowledge, because it's a steep learning curve. You have to know how to set IRQ settings, you have to know what devices are assigned to specific IRQ settings, and you have to know which jumper blocks to mess with, and it's just, it, it can get messy really fast. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install, I'm going to try to install a, um, a voice, um, an answering machine card. This is an answering machine card that was installed in a desktop PC much like this one over 20 years ago for a voicemail system uh, for a building. And I'd like to try to see if I can't get it to work on this machine. I think that'd be kind of fun. I have the software for it. If I didn't have the software, well, all bets are off. But I've got it. So now I have all my DOS stuff on here. Now, it's a good thing I had these drives, because the original drives um, wouldn't read my old DOS disks for some reason. They, um, they kept coming back with read errors. So the good news is I was able to get those disks running again. For DOS 3.3, the same discs, by the way, that I've been using since I was a kid. Um, honest to God, I've had the same DOS discs that I've had since I was a kid, and they still work. So, I guess that's my warning sign to start thinking about making backup copies of them. And, uh, that would be quite beneficial to me, eventually, when they do succumb to, to floppy rot. Anyway, um, now I've got to figure out how I'm going to rig up a PC with a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Um, so that's going to have to happen soon.
because now I want to start copying some of my other software onto this thing. And uh, I really would like to do that, you know. Um, now that I have it running properly and I've got two floppy drives that match and that work and a BIOS, or I'm sorry, a clock battery that works that I made myself. See, that's where it gets rewarding. you got to kind of come up with solutions for problems that you shouldn't have had in the first place. <laughs> or that weren't problems, or were problems that were addressed in uh, product designs years and years ago. Um, it looks like this case is actually painted on the inside. Or something. Yeah, it is. They actually painted the case right here. They painted it silver. That's interesting. Hmm. Hey. Alright, the next thing we need to do is clean this disgusting keyboard. Holy crap. Look at this thing. It is... It's black, man. It is bad. So, we've got the two fly. They don't really match. You know, I could repaint this blank here to be white. But one more time. So in our next video, we're going to address cleaning that damn keyboard. I'm going to try to procure some software. Some of the stuff that I may still have um, offhand. And I'm going to start loading this thing up. I would like to put some more memory in it if I could find some of those memory chips. But first, I need to identify what they are. Which could be fun. Real fun. <laughs> but, uh, and I think I might be able to get that key. I'm going to have to ask the original owner if he still has it. Um, he said he kept everything in a packet, including the software for the Irwin tape drive. I don't really have any plans of ever putting that back in, um, just because it doesn't really, it's not really necessary. Unless I have a reason to have a backup tape drive on an XT or PC. Actually, it's a PC. Not an XT, interestingly enough. Um, so stay tuned and uh, we will um, we will do some stuff with this pig because um, that's what it is. Um, it is a pig of a machine and uh, yeah, that works okay. There really isn't anything, let's see, basic. Oh wait, it's actually GW? No, it's uh, what the hell? Um, oh yeah, check disk. I forgot that was on this version. I thought basic was on here. TW basic, that's it. Yeah, that's there. Good, good stuff. Um, and let's exit. Is that does that work? No, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Um, there's always that. I know there's a way out of basic, I just don't remember what it was. So yeah, there it is, DOS 3.30. Uh, Originally shipped with a DTK desktop PC. Um, if I enter the date, will it keep asking me for it? I don't remember. Let's do it. Um, Let's see, zero four. Oh no, it, it it has it. Okay, I don't need to do anything. Um, oh, this drive does have bad sectors. I forgot about that. I didn't rem I didn't uh, see. You know. Are there any switches? No. Hmm. Trying to do this with my right hand is not fun. 
Oops. Ah, screw it. Um, <laughs> we've had our fun. I'm going to put this thing away when I'm ready to continue on. We'll, we'll move on with it.